All right, team, so here we go. Semester one final review packet. I'm just gonna go ahead and let you take a peek at some of the work and some of the answers here to give you some hints and some help as you are working on your packet here to get ready for final. So here's the back side of chapter one. Thought I'd give you a moment to peek at some of the work here. And then I also thought I would take the time to do number 10 and 11 for you, so here we go. For number 10, I'm gonna have to start with the distributive property here. So I carry down the eight, negative three times x is negative three x. Negative three times four is negative 12. On the other side of the equation, I got 20 and I got minus one. All right, now on the right side, these are both constants, 20 minus one, I know what that is, that's 19. I'm gonna fix that right now. Over here, I have a variable term, a constant on both sides. I'm gonna combine those constants together. Eight minus 12 is negative four, carrying down the variable term with me there. I wanna get x by itself. So I'm gonna do some opposites here. Let's add four to both sides. Leaves me with negative three x is equal to 23. I wanna do opposites again, or inverse operations, divide by negative three, divide by negative three, and I'm left with some kind of obscure decimal. Let's see what we get. Uh, 23 divided by negative three and leaves me with negative seven and two thirds as my final answer. All right. And then over here for 11, I started it for you. Um, on the left side of my equation, I had to use the distributive property again here. Then I'm combining the variable term this time, variable term, variable term, combine those to get negative six x. And then at this point, um, I actually know right now that the answer to this is going to be a no solution because the variable terms are the same at negative six x, the constant terms are different. So I know it's no solution. But if I didn't notice that, I would add six x to both sides. And that leaves me with eight is equal to 20 this all cancels, which of course is false. So eight is not 20, therefore no solution. Okay, moving on to chapter two here. Let's see what we got here. So letting you glance at a few of these answers and then thought I'd also talk briefly about three and four. So for three here, this translation notation is kind of funny. This means here that um, my shape needs to shift left three units along the x-axis. X takes me side to side. This tells me my shape needs to shift over to the left three. Y-axis takes me up and down. So this tells me I need to go up two on the y-axis, up two. So I'll just do a Q for you. Q prime would be left three, one, two, three, up two on the y-axis, one, two. There's my Q prime. That would be the coordinates one, six, one, six. All right, four is kind of the same thing, I, except for this time I'm giving you the notation, so let's look at some corresponding points. How about this top point here and this top point here? Now I wanna go from the solid to the dashed. So from the solid, I went left, one, two, three units. So I went X minus three. And then on the Y axis, I went down one, two, three, four. So that's Y minus four, all right? and just taking a quick peek at what we got down here. Seven, eight, nine. There's a real quick peek for you. This would be a reflection I would specify in the y-axis, actually, since this is a mirror image over the y-axis. All right, so there's chapter two. Here's a little more chapter two for you. Some work for number 11. These are similar figures. 
there's the work, I set up a proportion. Number 12 is kind of a funny one, finding the scale factor. Um, and it tells me I need to know from the dashed, or the dashed is a dilation of the solid figure. So from the solid figure to the dash, um, well, it cut in half. So this is a scale factor of one half. Now, if it was the other way around, if it was from the dashed figure up to the solid figure, well, then it's getting bigger, so that would have been a scale factor of 2. Uh, 13, 14, and so 14 here. Um, if I'm dilating a shape, which, by the way, a dilation is the only transformation in which a figure is similar but not congruent to the original figure. That's going to be a test question on your final. Um, to dilate a figure, I'm multiplying the coordinates. Here are the original coordinates of A. So to multiply it by a scale factor of 2 and dilate this shape, this would go to, well, 0 times 2 is 0. 1 times 2 is 2. 1 times 2 is 2. 3 times 2 is 6. So here's how I get my um, coordinates of the image. So I'm just multiplying everything times 2 to get my new shape and it gets twice as big. And that's a dilation. Okay, chapter 3. Thought I'd give you these examples. So interior plus interior equals exterior. That's how I set up this equation. Interior plus interior equals the exterior. I'm going to solve for A. I'm going to let you finish up that last step on your own. Um, this is different because exterior angles, no matter what the polygon, in this case it's a triangle, but no matter what polygon, the exterior angles must add up to the magical number of 360. That's where I get this equation, and I've given you one step, and I'm gonna let you carry out the rest of the work to find Z. Moving to the back here. Uh, parallel lines and transversals, you should definitely be familiar with these terms. And so here is 3, 4, and 5 for you. So 1 angles 1 and 5. 1 and 5, these are matching uh, corresponding angles. They're in the same kind of, they're in the same spot at the two different intersections. That's how we find corresponding. Vertical angles like uh, 6 and 4 are just right across from each other at the same intersection. And then alternate exterior angles are on the outside of the parallel lines and on opposite sides of the transversal. So we have one and three there. Okay, here's looking at seven through 12. A few answers and a few hints on setup. Well, this would be 135. And this is again interior plus interior equals exterior is how I'm getting these. Okay. Moving along to the back here. So here we have polygons. We're finding the interior angle measures. So a trick here is to um, find out how many triangles this shape can be, be split into. So that's one. One triangle, two triangle. Every two tri every triangle is worth 180. If there's two triangles, then that means the sum of the interior angles must be 360. So I'm lo looking at number 14 here. I can split this into one, two, three different triangles. So the interior angle sum must be 180 times three. That gives me 540. That's how I set up this equation. All of this stuff here together must add up to 540. So 1x plus 1x is 2x. Constant, 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 all add up to 342. Down here we have exterior angles of polygons. Exterior angle, it doesn't matter what kind of polygon it is. The sum must be 360. That's how I can go about setting up these equations. Number 20 is kind of a funny one, so I'll just let you take a peek here. But I'm finding, I'm finding these angle measures based on the fact that these are parallel lines, and these sides are both transversals, so I can use adjacent supplementary to figure out these angle measures. Okay, moving on to chapter four here. 
here's a quick peek at the answers for three, four, five. And then looking at problems six and seven, these are very important questions. So x-intercept is where the line crosses the x-axis. In this case, it's right there at the point three comma zero. These are the coordinates for this point, the x-intercept. The y-intercept is where the line crosses the y-axis. So in this case, the y-intercept would be zero comma negative two. Those are the coordinates. Now these zeros actually matter, especially when I'm looking at number seven here. So to find the x and y intercept of, of an equation, I can always plug in my zeros. I can plug in zeros, just how the y is zero at the x-intercept, that's what I'm gonna do here. So to find the y-intercept, I'm gonna plug in zero for x. I've already set this one up. I'm gonna plug in zero, which makes, it kind of makes this whole term just disappear. This becomes 3y equals 12, divide both sides by three, y equals four. There's my y-intercept. Just on my y-intercept, that would be zero comma four. One, two, three, four. There's my y-intercept. Find my x-intercept, I'm doing it backwards. Plug it in zero for the x. So three x, that's three x is zero. That negative should not be there. Three times zero is zero, it basically just disappears. Three times zero is zero, it's gone, leaving me with negative four y equals 12. Divide both sides by negative four. Divide by negative four, divide by negative four, y is equal to negative three. Hmm, something's not right here. What did we do wrong here? Ah, this should have been the x here, three x, darn it. So my x intercept, this would have been x, Perfect video until the last page. X, X, my x-intercept is four comma zero. One, two, three, four, there's my x-intercept. And then my y-intercept is negative three. Okay, there we go. Zero, negative three. One, two, three on the y-axis, and now I can use a straight edge here to graph my line finding the intercepts. And I think I will do one more problem for y'all actually. Let's go down to number nine. Let's look at number nine here. Just a quick reminder about finding the slope between two points. I can use this formula. M equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is fancy for, we're just gonna take the y values and subtract them. So in this case, it's my y values are seven and three. So I'm gonna do seven minus three. My x values are three minus two, three minus two. So seven minus three is four, three minus two is one. So my slope here is just four. All right. Okay, team, happy studies. Hopefully this helps as you prepare for your final, and I will see you on test day. Bye for now.